Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Uh, today I will read from Vitruvius Without Text, uh, the biography of a book by Andrea Tavares, uh, published by GTA Verlag. This essay is not about Vitruvius, nor is it an attempt to reconstruct the, the architectura in relation to the author's life and cultural context. Instead, it aims to assess the rich and eventful printing history of Vitruvius' text. Printing has shaped our idea of Vitruvius, turning it from a text into a hunting entity, a mirage embodied in a book whose status as a reference for architectural theory is confirmed by five centuries of printed iterations. A review of the editions of Vitruvius traces how architectural theory has in the past been presented. Vitruvianism and the architectural ideas associated with it took shape in these books, in physical objects comprising words, certainly, but also in visual elements such as printed forms and illustrations. In its material qualities, each book embodies a plethora of information that contributes as much to the content as the words do. Hence, the hypothesis here has been to assess Vitruvius by ignoring its text and discovering its content beyond the words. When the tradition of Vitruvian publishing is stripped of words, instead of a naked body, we discover a nuanced vision of the history of ideas and architecture. It is not hard to charge the over 100 editions of Vitruvius, beginning with the Editio Princeps of Sulpizio da Veroli, printed in Rome between 1486 and 1487. Less than 60 years later, the text had been reprinted, illustrated and commented on in Florence, Venice, Como, Lyon, Toledo, Lisbon, Perugia, Strasbourg, Paris and Nuremberg. Each new edition varied in format, layout, paper, size and content. A timeline demonstrates that this frantic editorial pace continued in response to various demands, with every version of the book spreading and reconstructing Vitruvius' ideas. However, from the early Fra Giocondo pocket edition of 1513 to Luigi Marini's glorious and monumental 1836 folio edition in four volumes, the form of each edition mangles the Roman architect's words. Even in the most accurate philological reconstructions, the editor's work takes precedence over the source text. In the process of commenting on and reformatting it, even before the modern concept of the editor as we know it today was shaped, the editor, himself a publisher, a scholar, a translator or any other professional, becomes an author. There is Cesarianos Vitruvius, Gross Vitruvius, but no such thing as just Vitruvius. This multitude of authors dealing with the same source provides us with a unique overview of five centuries of architectural publishing. If we abandon the text to concentrate instead on the forms by which the text has reached us, we obtain a telling account of the uses of architectural books, demonstrating how they were used to shape theory and how theory was shaped to be handled. A pitfall in assessing architectural books is to get caught up in their form, forgetting about the architecture the books aim to convey. This can be avoided by anchoring the analysis to a precise architectural theme, allowing us to navigate the various editions by looking at different responses to the same problem. In the case of Vitruvian theory, this has been dominated by attention to the rules of proportion and the principles of the architectural orders that have driven architectural theory and practice since the 15th century. Nevertheless, Vitruvius discussed and considered a wealth of other architectural topics, one of them, described in a rather humble sentence in the third chapter of Book 6, Chapter 3, Paragraph 1, provides a key theme by which to survey how the book impacted the design of unique architectural projects, the Tetra style Cavedium. The sentence concerned places the cavedium in the interior of the private house without specifying whether it is meant for use in an atrium or a courtyard, and it offers several models to define its architecture. Tuscan, Corinthian, Tetra style, these pluviates and testudinate. 
Vitruvius goes on to explain that in the tetra style the girders are supported at the angles by columns, an arrangement which relieves and strengthens the girders, for thus they have themselves no great span to support and they are not loaded down by the cross beams. Unlike the orders, the tetra style room is quite marginal in the Vitruvius canon, but the Despite, or perhaps due to this apparent insignificance, an image of such a room appears in the first illustrated printed edition of Vitruvius. As a result, the sentence was transformed from text into architecture, an architecture at once virtual in its challenge to future editors of Vitruvius and real in its influence on future buildings. Other themes might have been as equally telling of the wanderings between Vitruvian theory and architectural practice. The fact is that the tetral style room, without being prominent or emphasized by any architect, is as pervasive as it is discreet, providing a backdoor entrance to design that avoids architects' common rhetorical pledges. If there were any images in Vitruvius' original manuscript, they are long lost. Nevertheless, there have been over 10 different tetra-style rooms illustrated in the numerous editions of the book. While they share an allegiance to the sentence quoted above, the spaces represented display significant differences that are more telling of the architectural credos of each editor than of Vitruvius' intended meaning. Equally, these dissimilarities reflect the historical context of the editor's respective lives and eras. For example, the discovery and documentation of the archaeological remains of Pompeii and Herculanum in the 18th century offered new evidence that had not been available to Renaissance writers, who instead relied exclusively on literary descriptions for their knowledge of the Roman house. New archaeological discoveries meant that Vitruvius interpreters could access first-hand descriptions and representations of Cavedia, and the resulting change in the representation of tetra-style room was abrupt. Prior to this, and lacking any such clues, in the Renaissance there had also been much more space for invention and speculation due to Vitruvius' interchangeable use of the words atrium and cavedium, and the ambiguity of their meanings. Such architectural freedom, running contrary to the eventual normative bias of Vitruvianism, echoes the editorial freedom enjoyed when printing the text. This liberty does not arise from the words or from the meaning of the architectural theory, but from their materialization in the built forms of books and buildings. Thus, this humble and simple sentence will act as a pointer to guide us to the same page of each edition of Vitruvius, and so allowing a comparison of the books and their architecture. Such an exercise ignores the commonly recognized aim of Vitruvius' treatise to establish an architectural canon. However, even when the text of a Latin manuscript is published word for word, the print version shapes the text into a book and in doing so transforms the canonic source, manipulating the words to tailor them into a specific print and architectural culture. The books, in that sense, are the material traces of this culture. Vitruvius' treatise was well known as a manuscript long before it was first published in the late 1480s. In its original form, it must have consisted of ten handwritten rolls, the so-called ten books, but no copies in this format seem to have survived. Until the late 14th century, copies of Vitruvius were handmade and bound as codices and once the scholars of the early Renaissance honed in on Vitruvius as the main reference for ancient Roman architecture, they produced their own handwritten and hand-copied manuscripts in dialogue with their ancient predecessors, beginning a long line of Vitruvian writing. Vitruvianism thus has two aspects. First, the use of the Roman model as a template from which to articulate original contemporary architectural theory, and second, the production of authoritative Vitruvius editions to feed this dialogue with the source. Moreover, printed books could provide the needed support for both. 
Despite Leon Battista Alberti and Johannes Gutenberg being contemporaneous, there is no direct technologically driven link between the spread of the printing press and Renaissance architecture. The connection between architecture and print culture is more subtle and relies on figures like Aldo Manutius, who bridged the gap between private intellectual research and collective printed discussion on humanist topics. Before the printing press, verbal architectural descriptions were privileged over images, based on the assumption that textual transcriptions bore a higher degree of similitude between original and the copy than images did. In fact, and perhaps surprisingly, text is much more volatile than images. While woodcuts and, later on, copper and steel engravings could be relied upon to produce exact copies of architectural images, text was constantly changing. As language evolves, concepts shift and new words are coined. Book editors are expected to keep up, and so, even in cases where a book's visual references might be frozen in time by its illustrations, writing requires an ongoing effort to update bygone ideas to match contemporary concepts. Vitruvius' use of ancient concepts, Greek sources, unknown examples, outdated Latin and cumbersome syntax made his words more cryptic than explicit. More than a millennium after it was written, and despite its attractiveness as an authoritative reference, Vitruvius' content was anything but clear and accessible. Its intricacy was a constant challenge for readers, and new editions, while attempting to crack the textual enigmas, not only rescued the author's reputation from oblivion, but expanded it over the centuries. Printing was a relatively cheap way to make hundreds of identical copies of a book, avoiding the inevitable inaccuracies of manuscript copies, making the work ubiquitous and the author and the message long-lasting. Ultimately, the success of an author, Vitruvius included, relies on the capacity of its content to be reprinted. Hence, the enduring Vitruvian performance was not due to the sad eternal values of his message, but rather from its vagueness and volatility. Every new edition responds to a specific editorial context. What budget is available? Who is the audience? And when does the book have to be ready? Such questions, as relevant today as they were in Gutenberg's time, end up defining the qualities of the layout, the choice of paper, the provenance of the ink and the material characteristics of each edition. And beyond the material qualities of the edition, the integrity of the book itself can be circumscribed. Which version of the text to use, which illustrations, in what order, every time the book is reprinted these decisions have to be made all over again. For such a specialized author as Vitruvius, publishers have relied on editors to guide them throughout the process. Just as a reader shapes a text with their voice when reading aloud, an editor shapes a formless text into an object. And, just as with bound manuscripts, printed editions steer content and use the book form to fit the editor's own intellectual and social purposes. As a result, each reprint is also the reshaping of the text into a new form, whose reading and reception are equally determined by its cultural and social contexts. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.